So we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 15 today. Or 16, sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 16. <clears throat> we'll be starting at verse 1. We'll read through a large portion of it there, and then we'll kind of touch on briefly a few a few passages as we go through. Um, and so we'll just listen to the story. 1 Samuel 16. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a, a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me, the one whom I name to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sacrificed, or he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they came, he looked on Eliab, and he thought, Surely, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or in the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. And then Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? He said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent, and he brought him in. And now he was ruddy, and he had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel then set out, and he went to Ramah. So this morning we're talking about how the lofty are lowered and the lowly are lifted. And I'd like to start with a question. Have we been rejected by God? Perhaps not a question we ask ourselves every day. Perhaps not a question we think about a lot. We love to talk about God's love and God's acceptance, and all these amazing things. But what about his rejection? Are there those that he rejects? And if so, what is the criteria of rejection? And most importantly, is that me? And that leads us to talking about pickup lines and perfume. Because these are both things, whether you're a man or a woman, I'm not going to say who wears the perfume and who uses the pickup lines. You can decide that for yourself. But these are the things that we use to try to attract someone or to try to draw someone in or to try to be accepted by someone. And the question is, what if these things fail? We all know the really cheesy pickup lines that are just bound to fail before they're even out of your mouth. Some of those are pretty fun. But what if we're earnest? What if we're honest? What if we're really trying to draw someone in and they reject us? 
So we're chasing someone, yet we're rejected by them. It's a similarly thought of as a salesman at the door, right? A salesman comes to the door, and he's trying to sell you something. He's trying to give you something, and some people don't even open the door. Some people open it and say, no, I don't want anything. Some people entertain a bit and then say, I don't want anything, and some people actually buy things. Uh, but there, there, there's a way that the salesman comes, and then he's rejected at the door. And the question is, who is rejected, and who does the rejecting? Because we like to put things in categories, don't we? For instance, when we have a great pickup line and we go to a woman and we say it and she rejects it, we say, well, she's the re she rejected and I'm the re I, I am the rejected and she is the one who rejected me, right? But here's the question. In our chase for deciding who is rejected and who does the rejecting, does it really matter? At the end of the day, does it really make any difference? See, I think acceptance is a green light on a two-way street of a relationship, right? It's, I'm willing and desire to be in a relationship with you, and the other is obviously that you are willing to be in a relationship with me. And I think rejection works the same way. That if this person rejects me, then I am rejected, right? And if I reject this person, then I also, so it's, it's, it goes both ways, right? You can't say, well, I accept them, but they reject me, so somehow this is going to work out. Maybe one direction. It doesn't work out. It doesn't go anywhere. We all know, unfortunately, or maybe we don't all know, but I'm sure many of us know relational breakdowns, right? Where something happens and all of a sudden the whole relationship is just destroyed or isn't what it once was because something has happened in that relationship that now has brought an element of rejection in there. And even if you feel like maybe you're, maybe you're not in the wrong or maybe you don't know what to do to try to get this person to be in a relationship with you in the way it used to be or you're not quite sure what happened, whatever the way this happened, it still has happened. Whether they rejected you, whether you rejected them, whether you both rejected each other, the end result is the same. And in verse 1 we looked at, it says, God is saying that I have rejected him from being king over Israel. And the question is, why does God reject Saul? And the bigger question, does it matter whether God rejects Saul or whether Saul rejects God? Or maybe is there something to both sides here? Because at the end of the day, the relationship is somehow destroyed in a way that God can no longer continue with Saul. But we're not going, not going to go back into the entire story of sort of the, the downfall of Saul and why he was rejected. But there are many things he did, things he took into his own hands as king that he was not supposed to do. Things he did, he put himself in the place of a priest in certain scenarios where he basically figured, I'm, I don't need the priest, I don't need the person who was designed by God to do such and such in this scenario because I'm the king. And he's late, so I can do it myself, right? I can just get in there and figure it out and, and God will accept me because why wouldn't he accept me? I'm the king. And I think this is the first step in this scenario. Is that Saul has an attitude of heart that figures I'm the king. People are going to do what I want them to do and we'll just carry on. And that includes God. So Saul rejects God in his own life which leads to God rejecting him. And so there's a search for a new king. And as we go through the search, as, as, uh, as Samuel goes into Jesse's house and they bring them to the, to the, to the sacrifice, we kind of wonder, what is the criteria now? Because we know the criteria of rejection, in a way. The criteria of rejection is an element in our heart that somehow we have rejected something about God, and in return, he rejects something in us. And that thing he rejects is that our heart will not accept him. So something different in someone's heart has to be there. And we turn to verse 7 that we read, where Eliab comes before him. 
And it says, do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. Seems fairly simple. This son, the oldest, the greatest, the grandest, he's got this incredible appearance, he's got some height to him. He's the guy that normal people would choose to be the next king. But God says, don't look at all those things, because we had a guy in power who had all those things, and look at where it got him. That's not what it's about. He goes on to say, for the Lord does not look and does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. See, we think, do they or I have the skills for such and such a job, for such and such a position? And God thinks, do they have the heart? I remember when I was talking to, to my pastor before I became a pastor, I said, I think I've heard the call to become a pastor. And I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm not quite sure what the next steps are. I'm not quite sure where I'm going. So I just posed the question to him, as any person would. Do you think I have what it takes to be a pastor? Do you see that in my future based on all of the ways in which you have sort of interacted with me? And he kind of chuckled a bit and he said, it doesn't matter what I see. It matters what God sees. It matters what's in your heart. So the question is, is your heart willing to accept the call? The question is not whether you think you can preach an okay sermon or whether you think you can sit with someone when they're sick. That's not the question. Because I'm pretty sure if God's called you, he knows what he's talking about. So the greater question is, where is your heart? Where is your attitude in this? So he almost refused to answer my question, right? I was kind of looking for it. Yes, he thinks maybe I might be okay at preaching sometimes. Okay, then I'll answer the call to God, right? But he's not, I'm not even answering the question because the question is worded or phrased in a way that would lead you down a road you don't even want to start going down. And we think in one way and God thinks another way. <clears throat> so why was the oldest son rejected? It doesn't specifically say, but I think based on the sort of the overarching theme here, the context of the passage, we can uh, or think that his heart matched his appearance. Because we've talked about Saul, and if you walk through the story of Saul and you read it yourself, you see all these things about his heart and about his appearance and how he is. And then it starts out in verse 1 in chapter 16, I've rejected Saul because of his heart. And it continues on, and when we get to the end, we see that we've we accept David because of his heart. And we have all these people in between that something must be wrong with them. And it must be about their hearts. See, verse 11 talks about David. And what does it say? It says, there remains yet the youngest, but he's the keeping the sheep. He's just keeping the sheep. Number one, he's the youngest. Number two, he's keeping the sheep. A shepherd was not a person you looked upon in a friendly way. Shepherding the flock in this context was a dirty job. It was something you relegate to the people who maybe have done something and you don't want them in the camp, so you can send them out to take care of the sheep. They're rejected by people. They're looked down upon by people. And so when he says, bring your sons to the sacrifice, Jesse doesn't even entertain the thought of bringing David there because he's just the youngest. He's just the shepherd. Obviously, he wouldn't be thinking of him. He's not useful for anything, really. He's the lowest among us. But the question is, why was he the one who was accepted by God? And why were all the other ones rejected by God? I think it's because his heart also matched his appearance. That when everyone saw in him, on his outwardly appearance, God saw differently on his inwardly appearance. God saw someone who wasn't all full of themselves inside, but was empty inside and waiting and ready to receive what God is going to give to them. I think in this life, in this world, we can be so consumed by our own schedules, by our own plans, by our own abilities, that somewhere along the way we forget about God or we reject God and say, okay, you helped me a while, God, now I can handle it. I can pick this up and carry it for a while. 
I've got this all figured out. And that's the tendency in any job. That's the tendency as a pastor. I remember when Rob Sloat was here when I first came and, and I was just sort of figuring things out and things were just, didn't seem to be working out. And I, I came to him and I says, I don't really feel like I know what I'm doing. I don't even know how to start being a pastor. I don't know what that means. I don't know how this works. And again, he kind of laughed and he said, well, I don't know what it means either. And I think when I figured out the job, I shouldn't have the job anymore. Because if I've figured it all out, I don't need God anymore. And that is the foundation, that is the grounding of where we are. There's maybe a different way of, under, of thinking about, of understanding it, but it almost felt like it was the same direction, right? That I was looking for sort of the, the, the concrete answer. The, the, this is the things you need to do. And everyone was saying, that what you need to do is have a heart for God. And let Him lead, and, and He'll, Figure it out. And this is true in any area of our life. Unfortunately, this is especially true within churches. We are a group of people who by name and by design serve God. That's what we're here for. That's what we do in this space and in this group. And yet, how many churches are there out there that are self-serve? All about building up their own name. All about worrying about how many people are sitting in my pews on Sunday morning. This can be the bigger churches, it can be the smaller churches. It doesn't matter how big the church is, it matters how big the heart is. And of course we think about the televangelists who all are out there and it just looks like a promotional video and feels less like a sermon. We think about the pastors who as they're preaching they can't help mention this book they happen to write and it's only $15 on Amazon right now and then they continue on preaching, right? These are the things that we think about that's like, yeah, there's something in the heart there or at least I'm picking up something that makes me feel a bit off about this, right? It makes me feel like this person is more about them and their projects and their church and their business than about the business of God. But again, you don't have to be a famous person to have these types of things going through your hearts and through your minds. It can be any of us. It can be any of us here today sitting in this room wondering why there's only three, six, eight, nine people right now in this room. Right? And maybe when we get 10 or 11 people in this room, we think, oh, I must be doing something right. Let's keep doing that project or that program or that whatever. Because it's all about our little kingdom, right? So again, it doesn't matter who we are, it doesn't matter where we are, these things can crop up, can enter into our hearts. And that's normal. And that's natural. So we got a great response when we did this sort of, this thing for the community. Let's do that one again. Not, God got a great response. Not, I saw people's hearts changed for God, but, well, there were so many people here. It was, it just felt great to have so many people here. And I want to do that again so so many people can come here. You see the difference? There's nothing wrong with programs. There's nothing wrong with these things that we do, but we need to be very intentional about re recognizing where is our heart in this? What is our intent? What are we intending to do and where does that lead us? Where do we go with that? We may say, well, of course it's great to have more people through the doors on Sunday morning because then more people are hearing about God. But also, this is, there's an element of self-survival, right? That if we don't have enough people in the pews, then we'll die. We can fall into this trap about promoting ourselves more than promoting the gospel. And, and the trick... The deception is that we can put the two together and think they're the same thing. And yes, they're related, but it's very important to know where our heart is in these things. A uh, couple weeks ago, maybe last week, sitting down with the band, we we're deciding what sort of what uh, equipment we might need or we might desire to uh, build our ministry <clears throat> in the future. And so we looked at all sorts of things. We looked at speakers. We looked at cords. We looked at microphones. We looked at lights. We looked at all these different things, right? And we found this one website that this guy's job in his church, he was the, I don't know what, what they call it, the media organizer or whatever. But anyways, he was in charge of 
building the backdrops and making sure the smoker machines were all there and getting the lights just perfect and the whole thing. And so he was sort of training on his blog other churches about how they can do this, how they can make the show look nicer, right? And and one of the other guys in the band, he we were reading this and he kind of turns to us and he says, guys, if we ever become a church like that, I'm leaving the band. Because that's not what it's about. Yeah, it might be interesting, it might be nice, it might add to the flavor, but if that ever becomes what we're about, I'm out of here. And not that it was a it was a um awakening moment, but it was a reminder to us that yes, we are here to do a ministry that God has called us to do, and we can get caught up in oh that's that's nice, we should have all these cool things. And we sometimes have to take a step back and go, How is this gonna aid the ministry? How is this gonna guide? How is the Holy Spirit leading in this manner? And do we really need these things? And will they encourage the people? No matter where we are, we can fall in these traps. We like to think about, um, sort of from the outside, we think about the, the Pentecostal church and the speaking in tongues sort of thing. We go, that's just a show, right? And it's just this big show and it makes us feel uncomfortable. In the same way that some people go to churches with these giant backdrops and smoke machines and lights and they feel uncomfortable. And this isn't worship, this is... It's just, it's just too foreign. Right? We can easily become more about the programs and about the music and about the preaching and in fact to be a church that is devoid of the Holy Spirit. See, who is the Holy Spirit with in this passage? Who is the Holy Spirit with and who has the Holy Spirit Rejected. Verse 13 is an incredible verse. It says, Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him, that is David, in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Note two things about this. He was not anointed in secret. The big guys see the little guys receiving God's favor. It's almost a way of tearing down this entire regime that we like to build for ourselves, thinking that the biggest and the greatest and the grandest and the most popular, that must, those must be the people who God is with. And, and we can see that when we talk about in the greater spectrum in churches, we look at these big churches who have all these people and go, what are they doing right and what am I doing wrong? Because God must be with them because there's so much happening. But just because there's so much happening does not necessarily mean that God is more with them than he is with us. And in fact, sometimes it could mean the opposite. That they've gone so far in that direction that God has actually rejected them because they've rejected him. And so the little guy stands up in the presence of his brothers and is anointed with the Holy Spirit. And the other brothers are looking around wondering, well, why isn't the Holy Spirit here with me and all of my projects and all of my programs and all of my good looks? So the second thing is that the Spirit is not with his brothers. Can we be a church who thinks we are following God well, but get caught up in following our own desires? And at that point, does the Holy Spirit reject us? Can we be in a church that the Holy Spirit is not in? Because we've left them on the curb to pursue other things. And if you think about it, a church whose sort of mission is to be with God and for God to be with them and to be doing the, mis the missions of God in their community if a church is without the Holy Spirit, that's probably the most scary place to be. Because it's a spiritual place without the Holy Spirit. And spirits like to be where spiritual things are happening. So I wonder what type of spirit will replace it. And oftentimes it is the spirit of pride, right? I think when you enter into a place, when you enter into a space, you can feel the feeling you get when you go there, right? You feel, or I, just, I went there and I felt like God was with me. Or I went there and I felt like the pastor was more interested in whatever, right? 
There can be a spirit walking with us or within a space that is the spirit of the place itself. I think the spirit of pride is the very spirit of, of the devil. When we go back to the garden, and we go back to all these great stories about how Satan is sort of tempting Eve with the desire for more power, right? Because you can think of greater of yourself than you do now. You can take of this fruit and get this knowledge that you don't have right now, and then you won't need God anymore, really. You'll have everything. you find pride in yourself. And we, as individuals, run into this spirit all over, within our hearts, as we see other people, I want to talk about 2 Corinthians 5 for a moment before we close here. 2 Corinthians 5, this is a passage that's talking about people who are proud of something. And the reasons why we can take pride in them. It's about this thing that grounds us, this thing we call the gospel, right? I want to start in 2 Corinthians 5, start at verse 12. And we'll read through till verse 17, then we'll talk a bit. It says, We are not commending ourselves to you, again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on. Because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and raised for them, and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ... There is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The only room for pride is pride in Christ. And it's interesting how they talk about themselves here. They say, you can have pride in us, but not because of anything within us. But to show the people who have pride in their own outwardly appearances that it's more about pride in the heart, more about pride in what God has done for us, more about this message. That's what we're proud of. We're proud to carry that message into the world because Christ can do so much more than we could ever. And in verse 13, they say that's why we're crazy people, right? For if we're beside ourselves, they say, it's for Christ. We're completely crazy. Because that's not the normal way of doing things. That's not the normal way of working out things in this world and in this life. The normal way is to find something in yourself to be proud of and attach onto it because that's the only way you'll get through your life, right? Isn't that what we're told? That there's something, there's incredible issues with self-esteem in our society, in our culture. So instead of putting yourself down all the, all the time, find something good about yourself that you can take pride in. And internalize that so much that all the negativity is washed away. And it's good advice, but it's missing one element. That there is something within myself I can take pride in, but that thing is not of myself. It is of God and His Spirit within me. That's what I can take pride in. That's what I can travel with, because that is the thing that lasts forever. It's sane to look after ourselves. It's sane to look at ourselves first. It's insane to look outside of that. Verse 15 and verse 16 talks about dying to ourselves because of he who, he who died for us. It says, no, live no longer for themselves in verse 16. And then in verse 16, regard no one from a human point of view. Regard no one from a human point of view. And if we go back to 1 Samuel, we see that he's talking about how, yeah, 
man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. There's a way that we look at things, and yet now in First Corinthians we sit, we're told, but we're not supposed to look at things that way. There's a better way, there's a different way to look at things, to look at people. We're not looking from a human point of view. And so when we meet people, when we talk to people, yes, we are to tell about ourselves, but only so much as to open the gates to be able to talk about Jesus. We all know, know these people, right? And they seem a little bit crazy sometimes. When you talk to someone and they seem like they've barely started talking about themselves and all of a sudden they're talking about what God has done in their life and this other thing. And isn't it incredible that when I just look out my window, I can see God and, 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 and you almost feel overwhelmed by how much they're talking about God. But I know someone who, who says they had a friend like this and it made them annoyed, even though they were a Christian, how much this person talked about God. And I think it less made them annoyed and more made them convicted. Because can't you just stop? Like it's just, well, the answer is no, you can't. You can't. Everyone's annoyed by something. For instance, you know where someone's putting all their, all their uh, stuff, shall we say, when when they're talking about that all the time, right? There's people you talk to who you can barely start talking to them when they ask you, oh, did you see the game last night? And you could say no. You could say, I don't care about hockey. You could say any of those things, and they don't really care. They'll just talk your ear off about why so-and-so player is better than such and such player, and this team is great. Wasn't this play awesome? And, and they perhaps know that you didn't watch the game, that you don't know anything about hockey, but that's of no interest to them because they're so excited to tell you about this game they saw that was just so amazing, right? And we may think they look crazy at times. Well, okay, you've been crazy about hockey. I'm just going to take a step back for a minute and go do something else. And you can be crazy about anything. So the question is not are you crazy, but what are you crazy about? What do we talk about so much that it drives people bonkers? What can't we stop talking about? And I think it very much tells us what is in our heart. What is of, not what is in our heart, but what is of primary concern in our heart. And I think the moment that we can no longer find a way to talk about God, we don't know what to say about God, when we don't think about God, we've rejected Him in some way. And then we wonder why God isn't using us, why God isn't doing something in our life. Perhaps it's just like the story of Saul where God traveled with us, God put us in a vision, God started us on a road, and somewhere along the way we lost track. And God says, I've rejected Saul, and I'm going to find someone else who can carry this torch." And it's sad to say, and it's unfortunate, but there's that tendency within each one of us that we can become crazy about something else far more than we're crazy about Jesus. So the question I'd like to leave us with today is not the tendency that we always have, right? Where we look at other people, we go, well, I can see that this person has an issue with such. I can see that such and such a church they really need to get their act together. I can see that this pastor, he cares more about his promoting his books than preaching the gospel. It's easy to do that part. The hard part is to internalize that and go, God, how can I serve you better? How can I be more crazy about you than I am today? God, show me those things in my heart and in my life that are out of check with you. How can I re-surrender those things to you or surrender them for the first time to you and say, yes, I want to follow you more fully and more well now today? So that's what I'd like to leave us with is just to, to, to take that into our own personal walk with him and just perhaps discover some things. Perhaps we know them right now, perhaps we don't. About how we can better attune our heart to God, continue to walk in faithfulness to him.